Lord God, uh, we confess that we have been prejudiced against you. We've prejudged you. Uh, Lord God, I pray that you would open our hearts to your judgment, that we would hear you, that we would see you, that we would know you because we know that you have known us. Father, I pray that you would help us to preach. And Lord, this is like, I don't know, 24th sermon in Romans or something. And so I pray for those that maybe pop in that haven't heard the other parts. I pray that your spirit will connect all the dots in all of our hearts. Um, that, Lord, we would see that Jesus is the meaning, he's the plot, and he is good. It's in his name that we pray, amen. Last week, uh, we ended our, our message at Romans 9, verse 18. So then, God has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills which obviously means that God's will is stronger than our will, which clearly implies that only one will is a truly free will, and that's God's will. So then God has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who can resist his will, who can resist his, his plan, who can resist his will is really, literally such, such a mind-boggling question, if, if you think about it. Because God wills reality into existence, right? With his word. He says, let there be, and there is, and it's good. And it's finished. And yet it seems that we can say, let there not be good and truth and love. I mean, it seems that we can sin, and that's not good. That's evil. And so it all implies that, well, when we do sin, we're like trapped in an illusion that seems real, but ultimately is not real. <laughs> At least the way that God and the good is real. When you have a, a dream, you know, that turns into a nightmare, you're trapped in illusion, right? An illusion that seems real, but ultimately is not real. Your consciousness, the I that observes me, is conscious of an illusion that you don't know is an illusion till you wake up. I once had a horrid dream that I was a Nazi guard gunning down inmates in a prison somewhere. But in my dream, I remember thinking, this isn't me. I'm a Christian. Jesus doesn't do this. <laughs> and I woke up. I woke up. When I awoke, I was still I, but I had an Im a memory, a memory of an evil me that didn't actually exist except as knowledge of what I am not, which made me grateful for who I am. Well, there certainly is such a thing as sin and evil, at least in this world. I just wonder if we'll think of it differently in the waking world. Verse 19, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault, Paul? Why does God still find fault for who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to or, or to argue with God? Well, what is molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay? Who are you, O oh man? to argue with God. Sin is violating God's will, right? And even if it's only a bad dream, he must will that we would have that bad dream. And I would think that arguing with God is a form of resisting God's will. And so he must will that we would dream our self-centered dreams and even resist his word when it entered our dreams to wake us. You know, when you're wakened from a nightmare by a word of, of love that descends um, into your nightmare, you can resist that word, right? I mean, perhaps even crucify that word. 
Because you know, there is a word that descends into every nightmare. And in the waking world, there are still scars on his hands and his feet. Even if the dream is an illusion, his love is real. Romans 13, verse 11, Paul's going to write this. The hour has come for you to wake from sleep. The night is far gone. The, the day is, is at hand. So anyway, the question, who can resist his will, will just like blow, blow your mind. But now let's ask Paul's first question. Um, and I think we ask this one pretty often, right? God, if you're in control of everything, why do you blame me for anything? Why do you find fault? I think that most people would say, well, he's not actually, um, Peter, in control of everything because, see, ultimately, we are in control of ourselves. But I think Paul just argued, well, God is at least in control of everything good and therefore at least allows for everything evil. So God is light and he allows for the dark. God is I am, and he, he at least allows for the illusion of I am not. God is good, and he makes space for the not good, which is evil. So why does God find fault? Find fault is one word, a verb in Greek, uh, memphomai, is translated find fault or blame. And I guess this is what really fascinates me about Jesus and God the Father. Don't know if you've ever really noticed this, but they, they definitely find fault. But I don't know that I can think of any place in Scripture in my experience where they blame the way we blame, as if someone should have, could have, or would have done something differently if, you know, they'd only tried a little harder or willed a little more intently, or exerted just a little more effort. Remember when the Pharisees threw the woman caught in adultery at Jesus' feet in John 8? He did not say, Samantha, or whatever her name was, I really expected a little more from you. I'm kind of disappointed in you. Frankly, I'm disappointed in the lot of you, those that brought her here and, and, and Samantha. I'm, I'm ashamed in all of you, I'm disappointed in all of you. Next time, let's all just try a little harder, could we? Instead, he said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And by doing so, he found fault, the fault, in everyone. Then he said to the woman, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. In John 9, it gets even weirder. Jesus and his disciples see a man born blind. The disciples say, who sinned, this guy or his parents? And Jesus says, it's not that this guy sinned or that his parents sinned, but that the works of God might be revealed in him. He was born blind so that, having been blind, he could see and we could all see the works of God in him. Jesus says, for judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. Some Pharisees overhear this, and they say, well, are we blind also? And Jesus says, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. I think he's saying you say that you see, but you're blind to your own blindness. Sin is choosing not to see. Sin is choosing an absence of, of light, right? Sin is a lack of faith in the light. Sin is a, a blindness of the heart. And yet, Jesus doesn't seem to blame them as if they could have chosen any, any differently. John 12, just after Jesus says, trust in the light, that you may become sons of light, John writes, therefore, they could not believe. They could not believe, for again, Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Those are God's words to Isaiah in Isaiah uh, chapter six, when God tells Isaiah to preach, remember, we talked about this last week, preach Israel down to a stump, and the stump is the holy seed. You know, if the Pharisees hadn't been blind, they wouldn't have crucified the light. 
and we would not have, they would not have seen the light shining in the darkness. The light is eternal, and the darkness is, well, a bad dream. But you see, their blindness prepared all of us to see the light. But, but my point right now is that we don't normally yell at blind people, right? I hope you don't. I mean, blindness is a fault. It's something that's not right but wrong. We don't yell at blind people as if it was their own fault, as if they chose it. And this means that a lot of what passes for evangelism is really just yelling at blind people and deaf people and, and dead, dead people. It's yelling at sinners because we don't have compassion on sinners and often, well, we're often jealous of sinners, which means we're pretty blind to our own blindness. Well, Isaiah and Jesus preached the Pharisees into a deeper blindness that they would one day see their own blindness in the brilliance of the light. And, and Jesus, well, that's all because Jesus had compassion for sinners, particularly Pharisees. See, Jesus definitely finds fault but he doesn't blame us if we should have, could have, or would have known better. As they took his life on the tree in the garden, he lifted his head, and you remember what he said? He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I used to think Jesus messed up his lines. I thought, come on, Jesus. Those guys have knowledge of good and evil, and, and they did know about good and evil, right? I mean, they knew the law but they did not know the good, for they just nailed him to a tree. Jesus didn't mess up his lines. He found fault, but he didn't blame anyone or, or anything, as if everything were not going exactly according to plan. See, God definitely finds fault, but he doesn't blame as if it were our fault, as if he had expected us to do differently. You know, whenever I feel ashamed and want to hide, I, I must be listening to a voice that whispers, you know, Peter, God expected more from you. God's disappointed in you. He didn't see that one coming. You better hide. Remember when God found Adam and Eve hiding in the trees in the Garden of Eden? I mean, he didn't say what we would expect him to say, right? He didn't say, oh, wow, I am so disappointed in the two of you. I expected so much more from you, and you, you guys, you really, you really let me down. You know, maybe you should have used your, your free will and accessed your knowledge of good and evil and tried a little harder, willed a little more, exerted a little more effort to make yourself in my image so that when I found you, I'd be impressed. You should have known better. He didn't say that. Why? Because that is precisely the point. Adam didn't have the knowledge of good and evil, and making himself in the image of God is not God's expectation, that's Satan's temptation. God is the good, and evil is not trusting his word, but how can Adam trust his word when he doesn't know the word and that the word is good? See, Adam was born blind. And he was born blind to his own blindness. God made Adam, and Adam couldn't find his helper, his Azer, who was right there with him. He was blind to love. And so God said, it's not good that the Adam, that humanity, is alone. Not good. Well, everything is good on the seventh day, and so this must be the sixth day. So on that day, God put humanity into a deep sleep, a tardema. Then God separated Adam into Adam and Eve. He caused a disunion. Why? Well, maybe that there might be a freely chosen communion. But Eve is not Adam's helper. And Adam is not Eve's helper. Scripture makes it clear that only God is our helper. 
our azer, humanity's helper. God alone is our helper, our husband, our Lord. So God made Adam and Eve, and God had planted a tree in the middle of the garden, a tree that could kill and make alive, and he left them apparently alone with an evil talking snake. Why? Well, because Adam, humanity, was blind to our own blindness. There was a fault in Adam even before the fall. And Adam couldn't see the fault. Adam was in the presence of God. Love himself was standing next to Adam and Adam couldn't find his, his helper. In him, Adam lived, moved, and had his being and Adam was totally unaware. Can you imagine such a situation? He couldn't know God for he couldn't see who I am is. I am is not the, the evil, I am is the good, and, and the good is life that's freely given. You can't freely choose the good if you can't even see him. Well, when God found Adam and Eve hiding in the trees after they took knowledge from the tree, he found fault. Although they tried to hide the fault, because you see, they knew about the good, but they still didn't know the good. He found fault, but he didn't blame them as if they could have, you know, done differently. Yet he did send them into deeper darkness until the day that they were ready to surrender to the light, who is the good and the life and our helper. We don't know the good until the good knows us. We come back to the tree, we watch him deliver up his spirit and cry, it is finished. But well, my point is that God finds our faults. But he doesn't blame as we blame. So why does he find fault? A, a fault is something that's broken, right? Or inadequate. We pay doctors to find faults. It's actually good news when the doctor says, hey, uh, I, I know exactly why you're, you're not sleeping. It could be what we would call my fault, like drinking too much caffeine, or maybe not my fault, like some sort of hormone imbalance, a fault in my body, but check this out. I didn't create my body. And I didn't actually create my desire for caffeine. I'm just saying doctors find faults, not to blame but to heal. Teachers find faults. They help students know what they did not know. So they would know something that they didn't know before, but, uh, but it's a pretty poor teacher that would blame a student for, you know, like being five years old. I'm just saying teachers find faults, not to blame, but to teach. Makers find faults. Anyone who makes anything in the process of making that thing looks for faults. That is places that what? Still need to be made. A carpenter, a potter, an artist, they, they find fault. Not to blame, but to finish their own creation, their, their masterpiece. Imagine if that masterpiece were conscious. <laughs> what would they think? Self-conscious. My point is that God finds faults, but he doesn't blame as we blame. And yet we do blame. But we're not very good at finding faults. That is who it is that is actually the blame for the faults that we find. We talked about this last week. I mean, remember, we all love to draw the line between good and evil, and I suspect we do that so that we can figure out just who it is that is to blame. Wanted to show you this picture last week, but we ran out of time. Where do you draw the line between good and evil in this picture? There is fault, but who's to blame? Whose fault is it? This is a picture of the first convicted war criminal in Ukraine. You know, I've been so angry at the evil perpetrated in the Ukraine at the hands of Russian soldiers. But when I saw this picture of Vadim Shishimarin, 
it took my breath away. See, there's no doubt that great evil was committed at his hands as he pulled the trigger. And you remember shot a Ukrainian man riding, an unarmed Ukrainian man riding a bicycle. But I hope you also know that we're all desperate for a scapegoat, right? And Vadim Shishimran is the best that we can get our hands on right now. And yet I look at Vadim and I see my son Coleman <laughs> in high school when he got busted for pot. I mean, they almost look exactly the same. Coleman isn't perfect. Not yet, but he is like my masterpiece, my artwork, my student, my patient. I'd literally die to make him well. I look at Coleman and I see me. So where is the line? Where is the line between good and evil and who's to blame? Is it Vadim's free will that is to blame? You know, physicists, psychiatrists, and theologians all argue as to whether or not there really even is such a thing. And even if there is such a thing, what on earth could it be? The Bible doesn't even use the term. Did you know that? It speaks of God's will, our will, and freedom, but not free will as, as such. St. Paul writes about freedom, and yet he just told us in chapter 6 that every one of us is a slave. You are either a slave of sin or you're a slave of righteousness. You're a slave of the devil or you're a slave of Jesus. And yeah, Jesus sets you free as he is free. Jesus, the slave of all. But this is the point. A slave can't just freely will to will himself free, particularly free of himself. So who's to blame? Vadim's free will? Or maybe the free will of Vadim's commander who ordered him to pull the trigger and shoot the man? Or Vadim's parents who didn't stop him from joining the Russian army? Or, or Vladimir Putin who chose the war? Maybe Vladimir Putin's parents or maybe the Nazis or Joseph Stalin or that Jew, Karl Marx. Karl Marx, I mean, what about Karl Marx? But then, but was it Karl Marx's nature or was it Karl Marx's nurture? Because, because Karl Marx didn't make himself and Karl Marx didn't pick the family that he was born into, the tribe of, of Judah. And if Karl Marx had a free will and free Free will is not nothing but something Then he didn't make that free will for God is the maker of all things and must even allow for the no things like evil. You see, all of our blaming leads us back to God. And back to Paul's question, which is a prophetic word from Isaiah, chapters 29 and chapters 45. Israel, says the Lord, you turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay that the thing made should say of its maker, he, he didn't make me? Woe, sorrow to him who strives with his maker. Does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making, or your work has no handles? Something's wrong with me? As Paul quotes it, why have you made me like this? Well, why did you make... Vadim like this, and Vladimir Putin like this, and humanity like this, and reality like this. Lord, I'm aware of some faults, and it looks like you're to blame. Romans 9.20. But who are you, O oh man, O oh Adam, to answer back, to argue, to dispute, to reason with God? You know, that was an utterly fascinating question especially in light of the fact that Paul had basically memorized Isaiah. And in Isaiah, chapter 1, God says to Israel, come now, let us reason together. Come now, let us reason together. Let's also trans dispute together or argue together. Though your sins, that's our brokenness, our incompleteness, our faults, though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. When Susan and I decided to have our fourth child, and name him Coleman, we kind of expected him to argue with us. We kind of even hoped that maybe one day he'd reason with us. And we would have been infinitely disappointed if he had not. For if he had not, he would not be human. And we would not have been able to shape him in our image. And Coleman, Coleman would never be free. 
So come now, Israel, says God. Let's have an argument about your faults and your neighbor's faults. And let's see if we can find fault and place some blame. You know, the name Israel literally means wrestle, wrestler, wrestles with, with God. And Paul has just mentioned Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Moses. In Genesis 18, as we spoke on last week, check this out, by a tree, Yahweh appears to Abraham as a man who is also a walking, talking promise. And he informs Abraham and Sarah that he will return and Sarah will have a son. But then God considers hiding from Abraham what he's about to do. For in Abraham and his seed, all the nations of the world will be blessed. All the nations. And you see, that would include Sodom. Well, after the good news of the promised seed, God informs Abraham that he's going to Sodom to judge Sodom. And then, and then Abraham begins to argue with God. Almighty, all-knowing God. It's the very first argument with God recorded in all of Scripture. Abraham says, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it? Far be it from you to do such a thing. In other words, God, you're not acting like yourself. You know, whenever we argue that God is not good, we're arguing that God is not acting like himself, or God is the good. And the very definition of the good that we use in order to argue with the good and judge God is not good. Well, God says, Abraham, for 50, I'll spare it. So Abraham says, I'm dust and ashes, which, by the way, is what he's going to reduce Sodom to, right? Dust and ashes. I'm dust and at least for a time. I'm, I'm dust and ashes, but what about 45? And God says, well, okay, Abraham, for 45, I'll spare it. Abraham then argues for 30, then 20, then 10, and God agrees, okay, Abraham, for 10, I'll spare it. And Abraham stops at 10, apparently, for the reason that in the Hebrew mind, 10 is the smallest number of persons that is still considered a people, a, a community. Because in the Hebrew mind, you cannot destroy a person without destroying everyone in that person's group, for each of us are the people that we love. Well, God doesn't find 10. And so you know the story. God reduces Sodom to dust and ashes. But through Ezekiel, about a thousand years later, he promises to make Sodom new, just as he makes or he's going to make Jerusalem new because Jerusalem is also going to be reduced to dust and ashes. But in Genesis 18, God doesn't appear to have informed Abraham of that fact. Why? Well, I guess it appears to me that God wanted Abraham to argue. And I suspect it wasn't just Abraham that was arguing. It was the promised seed already in Abraham. In Exodus 32, Check this out. Moses has a very similar argument with God. He's on the mountain with God, and God has just informed him that Israel has made a golden calf when God says this to Moses. Now let me alone, Moses, that my wrath can burn white hot against them, and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. Basically, Moses, you and yours can go to heaven while they go to hell. And Moses argues saying, but what about your promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? What about the glory of your name? And then God Almighty and God All-Powerful relents. He agrees with Moses and relents. And God is eternal. So go figure. I recently read a statement from a very well-known pastor defending the idea of predestination to a hell of endless torment. He writes, I have three sons. Each evening after they have fallen asleep, I lay my hands on them and I pray for them. But I realize that possibly God has not chosen my sons to be his sons. And although I think I would be willing to give my life for their salvation, I would not rebel against the Almighty if they would be lost. I think God would say to Pastor Piper and to the institutional church, 
How about a little more arguing? And do you really think that your compassion is greater than my compassion? Who the hell do you think I am? Well, Abraham argues. Moses argues. And then if you remember the story, Moses goes down the mountain. He grows furious. He just kicks some Israelite butt. Then he goes up the, back up the mountain and he says, Yahweh, they have sinned. But now if you, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book, the book that you have written. See, I think he's saying I'd rather be damned with them than saved without them. And then God says this crazy thing. He says, whoever sins against me, I will blot out of my book. Whoever sins against me. That means that each and every one of us has been blotted out of his book. And yet someone must have written us back in and all of Israel back in and even Sodom back in, according to Ezekiel, as if we each must experience rejection in time to know election for all eternity. Well, it's just after this that Moses asked to see the glory of God. Remember? And, and God says to Moses, no man can see my face and live, but you can see my, back, you can see my backside. While I hide you in the cleft of the rock and my goodness passes by and I declare my name, Yahweh, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy to whom I show mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Moses argued, but it wasn't just Moses that was arguing with God. It was the promised seed in Moses that was arguing that was reasoning and is actually the reason of God and the glory of God, the free will of God. 1,500 years later, he, the promised seed, would hang on a tree in a garden as all the sinners of the world took his life and he gave his life and he lifted his head and he cried, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. He reasoned with God. And he is the reason of God. He is the judgment of God. He is the free will of God Almighty. He is the true Israel of God. He's the wrestler at the edge of the promised land, the promised seed, in whom all the nations of the world will be blessed and through whom all will enter. To see him as he is, is to die with him and rise with him. Why? Because he's the face of God. He not only argues for salvation like Abraham did, he not only volunteers to be damned with his kinsmen like Moses did, he descends into hell in every dark place in which the children of Adam hide from the glory of God. He is the salvation that is God. Yahweh is salvation. It was 20 years later, 20 years after that, that Paul wrote to the Romans saying, I was praying that I myself would be a devoted offering, anathema from Christ for the sake of my brothers, the Israelites. Do you understand? That wasn't just Paul that was praying, that was reasoning, that was arguing with God. That was the promised seed in Paul. Paul, who is now the very body of Christ and perfect image of the invisible God. Paul, who was asking this question, what God will become of Israel? Why do you still find fault? For who can resist your will? And who are we to say to our maker, why have you made me and us like this? Who are we? Romans 9, 1 through 21a. This is what we read last week, okay, plus two and a half verses that we just read at the start of the message. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I was praying that I myself were anathema from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They're Israelites, and to them belong the sonship, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and 
And from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word, the logos of God, has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. More literally translated, not all of Israel is Israel. And like we preached last week, not all of Abraham is Abraham, and not all of Isaac is Isaac, and not all of Jacob is Jacob, and not all of you is you. Like Paul's taught us, there is an old you that's giving birth to a new and eternal you. Next verse. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his sperm. But through Isaac shall your sperm be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as sperm, as seed. Jesus said to an old Pharisee in John chapter 3, verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Whose spirit is he talking about? Well, his spirit, the spirit of the promised seed. John 3, 7, he continues, Do not marvel that I said to you, you all must be born again. You must. That's the judgment of God. Romans 9, 8. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as seed. For this is what the promise said, about this time next year I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man or one coitus, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or evil, in order that God's purpose of election, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger, as it is written, and this is written in Joel a thousand thousand years later, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And we say, well, wait a minute. Where's the fault? And uh, who's to blame? Ten years ago, I preached a whole sermon on just this verse. It was titled, Does God Love Everyone, Even Esau? I was going to go uh, rework it and re-preach it, but I like it as it is, and you can access it on our website online. I, I, I preached it, though, because Calvinists, who seem to like the idea of endless torment, they just love this verse. But they're not paying attention. It says hated, past tense, as if this happened in time, but not hates, as if this is still happening and happens forever. And they forget that there is no forever without end. Why? Because Jesus is the end. And the wrath of God comes to an end. Scripture says that several, several places. And they forget that God is love, and so it's love that is doing or has done this, this hating. And they don't notice that when love hates, love burns until there's nothing left to hate, and everything is filled with love. And they forget that love hates all, according to Scripture, all evildoers, all the proud, Love hates the darkness in which Adam hides. So God not only hated Esau and Edom, his descendants, but all of Adam that is spelled in Hebrew without the vowels, before they had the vowels, and it's spelled exactly the same as Edom. And they forget that God began to hate Israel the moment they crossed the Jordan, according to Hosea. And they don't notice that Esau, the firstborn, looks an awful lot like Jesus, the firstborn. And Jacob, who cheats him out of the blessing and the birthright, looks an awful lot like us, who cheated Jesus out of the blessing and the birthright as he cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, the firstborn? And they forget that it was all according to plan, for in this way all Israel will be saved, Romans eleven twenty six, and all sinners are justified, Romans three twenty three. They forget the promised blessing. That through the seed of Abraham, passed down through Israel and Judah, God blesses all the nations of the world, including Edom, Sodom, Egypt, Judah, Russia, Ukraine, Esau, and you. But mostly they entirely miss the point of election, and that is that God elects, and we don't. Why? Because God has free will. So who does God elect? And on whom does God have mercy? Well, see, that's the huge point to which Paul is building. 
Don't stop reading at chapter 9, particularly verse 13. As it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice, unrighteousness on God's part? Hell no, is how my Greek professor said to translate that. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So that it depends not on human will, not on exertion, human exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. But you know, scripture says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. How do you suppose he hardened his heart? Maybe, just maybe, God delivered him up to his own desires. Just like Paul argued that God delivers all of us up to our own desires in Romans chapter one. Maybe God delivered up to his, to his, his own dream. Do you know all the pharaohs dreamed that they were God? and that they were the mediator between God and man. And so maybe he dreamed that he was his own creator, and that dream turned into a nightmare as he tried to justify himself and so create himself. We all dream that we are our own creator, which means that we have no creator, which means that each of us is utterly alone, which is an absolute nightmare, it's utter blindness, and it's the knowledge of evil. Verse 18, so then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. So who does he freely will to harden and upon whom does he freely will to have mercy? Romans 11.32, God has consigned all to disobedience, that's the hardening, that he may have mercy on all. That's the free will of God Almighty. And so who's to blame? Who's to blame if not Pharaoh, Esau, Israel, Ishmael, Sodom, Vladimir Putin, Vadim Shishimran, or, or, or me? So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. Verse 19, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay? You know, if, if what we just read is true about consigning all to disobedience in order to have mercy on, on all, you should be able to find fault like absolutely everywhere and in everyone. Egypt, Sodom, Israel, Edom, Ukraine, Russia, your neighbor, yourself. And yet the faults really won't be their faults. And what you thought was free will, well that might only be a bad dream. There's only one will that is entirely free and who are you O oh man to answer back to God well, maybe you're his kid and maybe he would really kind of like it for you to ask some questions Maybe it's how he makes you in his own image and sets you free as he is free. So anyway, what I'm saying is jump on the blame train if you think it's necessary. But this is what you'll find. No matter where you start, and I mean no matter where you start, it will always arrive at the same location. Blame Vladim or Vadim Shishimran and you'll find yourself blaming his commander. And then you'll find yourself blaming his parents. And then Vladimir Putin, and then Joseph Stalin, and then Karl Marx, and then the Jews, or the Christians that blame the Jews. But whoever you blame, you just keep on blaming. And you'll find fault. And it will be a fault in them, but not their fault. For they are ultimately not to blame. 
You won't find the one to blame until you arrive at a tree in the middle of a garden. And you can blame the one hanging on the tree, for he is the free will of God. He is the beginning and the end and the way in between. He is the plot and the author. He subjected creation to futility. He planted the tree in the middle of the garden. He made the Adam and he consigned all Adam to disobedience. He put him to sleep and let that snake speak those lies. If you're gonna blame anyone, blame him. And yet there's a problem, isn't there? He has no fault. He isn't evil. He's the good. He's the will of God Almighty. And that means that everything that's anything and even the no thing is going precisely according to plan. You know, if I ever saw him, the face of God as he truly is, and so believed what I saw, I suspect that I'd like, well, I'd, I'd like die to one reality and find myself in another, even before, even before my body turned to dust. I, I imagine that, well, I'd suffer pain in this world. I'd be rejected in this world. I, I might even be crucified in this world, and that would not be fun. But I would be impossible to offend. I mean, seriously, you could not sin against me. Whatever you intended for evil, I would say, well, God intended that for, for the good. I'd forgive your sins before you could even commit them. I'd find faults, so to speak, but those faults would immediately turn into hope in, in me. I'd feel sorrow but never be anxious or afraid. And, and if you said to me, what's wrong with you? Are you sleeping? I'd say, well, actually, um, I think I'm just starting to wake up. And if you said, well, you're blind, I'd say, well, actually, for the very first time, I think, I think I'm beginning to see the light. A group of visitors at a summer resort had watched the sunset from the gallery of the hotel. A rather fat, unromantic-looking man had, had lingered until the last glow had, had faded, and, and he had just seemed thrilled through and through by the, the beauty of it all. One guest, more observant than the others, wondered about this. And so at supper, she said to this man who sat next to her, you certainly did enjoy that sunset. Are you an artist? No, ma'am. I'm a plumber. But I, I was blind for five years. I think Paul is saying that we were all predestined for a temporal bout with blindness, that we would return and forever see the light. I think the Bible is saying that we all were predestined to encounter evil, that we would forever choose the good in freedom. I think that we all may be having something like a nightmare, but soon we'll awaken in our Father's arms, return to reality, and know it, know God, and know ourselves for the first time. Well, anyway, what I'm saying is if, if you need a scapegoat, if you need someone to blame, at the end of the day, there's only one and he's the good, and he's the life. But just look at him. He's not blaming you. You broke his body, and you shed his blood with every one of your self-centered judgments. 
With every one of your self-centered judgments, you broke his body. But this is his judgment. He breaks the bread and he says, this is my body given to you. And he takes the cup and he says, this is the covenant, the eternal covenant in, in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. This is the free will of God Almighty and God is love. And you will love for he has first loved you. Now, I think I just spoke the word of God. May the word of God dwell in you richly. And so who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Who do you think you are, Abraham, arguing with God? Who are you, Moses, to reason with God? Who are you, Jesus, to answer back with God? I know who you are. You're his kid. Who are you, Paul, to ask these questions? And he would tell you, well, it's no longer I who live, but Christ Jesus who lives in me. You're, you're his kid. You're, um, well, you're his masterpiece. <laughs> you're his image under construction, predestined for freedom. So believe the gospel. And when you believe it, and I've had moments, I've had a moment here and there, but in those moments, I'm free. Or maybe I should say, we're free. Jesus and me are free. Amen.